do you say? Time for a new shed? Hey, hands. All right, buddy, you ready to do this? In this video, I will show you how I built my 12 by 20 modern shed. For the foundation, I'll be using the pier and beam method. I picked up this power auger to help dig the holes for the Sack Creek tubes. My goal was to dig down at least 24 inches. For my foundation, I'm using 10 8 inch Sack Creek tubes and fiber reinforced concrete. Further strengthen the concrete piers, I drove in two sticks of 3 8 inch rebar. While the cement was still wet, I placed my 4x4 concrete brackets. After a couple days when the cement dries, two 20-foot 4x10 beams will rest on top of these brackets. So, got ourselves a 20-foot uh, 4x10 pressure treated. Pretty heavy to move by yourself. I got a little trick though. Floor foundation, I will be using all pressure treated lumber, two 20 foot 4x10s and 16 12 foot 2x10s. To help set the outer floor joist, I used a pocket jig and a couple of 3 inch coated screws to hold things in place until I could drive in my headlock leg screws. It's a good idea to pre-drill before screwing in your leg screws. Before you install your floor joists, you need to attach all your joist hangers. By pre-measuring and use a little scrap piece of 2x10, it's easy to set and place your joist hangers at 16 inches on center. Throughout this project, I'll be using Hillman Deck Plus screws as my main fasteners, except for when I'm using the headlock leg screws. I used 28 hangers in total. Once the joists were in place, I put down 6 mil plastic sheeting to create a vapor barrier. For my subfloor, I used 8 sheets of 3 quarter inch 4x8 pressure treated marine plywood. Perfectly square. Dance floor is done.
right, well, I'm uh, going up. For the rear wall, I'm using three 20-foot 2x4s and 18 8-foot 2x4s, doubling up the ends in the top plate. On the top plate, I preemptively cut two 3.5 inch notches to create a slot for the two side walls to lock into. For the north wall of the shed, I used 10 8 foot 2x4s and 3 12 foot 2x4s, doubling up only the top plate. Notice the little 3.5 inch tab I left on the end of the top plate. So, that little three and a half inch tab should join in perfectly in the corners. On the front wall, I used two 20 foot 2x4s, two four 10 foot 2x4s, two 18 8 foot 2x4s, two, two 20 foot 2x6s, two and one 8 foot 2x6. Two it's not easy to see here, but I sistered together the two 20 foot 2x6s two above the windows as well as the 2x6 above the door. For the final wall, I used two 12-foot 2x4s, 12 8-foot 2x4s, and one 8-foot 2x6 sistered together above the window to create a header. I used the same 3.5-inch tab trick again to lock in the back wall. These are uh, Simpson Strong Ties. You can do 16 inches on center. You can do 24 for uh, the rafters, but going 16. To prep for the rafters, I hung 28 Simpson strong ties at 16 inches on center. 16 inches matches up perfectly with the metal roofing panels I am installing later. This in turn will ensure that every fastener hits a rafter when I screw down the roofing panels. Alright, so getting ready to make my bird boxes. For a 2 foot rise over 12 feet, you'll want to set your angles at 9.5 degrees and measure up 5 eighths of an inch. You will also want to make your end cuts at 9.5 degrees. Here we go, gonna cut some, some bird boxes. Make sure your end cuts are at the same nine and a half degrees as your bird box. We're gonna do a little test fit. Uh, throw the two by eight up and wrapped her up. And we'll see how she looks. Looking pretty good. All right, so the rafter test fit was a success. Once I was happy with the test fit, I used my initial rafter as a template, tracing the bird boxes and end cuts onto 16 of the 18 rafters. I only traced the end cuts on the two outer rafters. Once I had the majority of rafters in place, I had to finish the framing of the outer walls before I could install the two rafters that sit on the edge. To help attach the 2x8 rafter nubbins, I fastened the scrap 2x4 to act as a temp ledger. This helped keep everything in line as I screwed them in. Here I'm using the same temp ledger and a small 2x4 scrap to hold my 2x8 fascia board in place as I screw it in. I use the same method in the back. On the top of the rear fascia, I attached three scrap 2x4s to act as a stop for the plywood to rest against, helping me square things up when I begin sheeting the roof. To sheet the roof, I used 12 sheets of half inch plywood. For the exterior walls, I used 19 sheets of half-inch plywood. To hold things in place, I used a scrap 2x4 as a temp ledger.
came time to cut in the window, I temporarily attached the sheet to the wall so that I could trace out the window. Once traced, I would take down the plywood and use my skill saw, using the plunge cut method to cut out the window. To keep my cuts nice and clean, I used my jigsaw in the corners. What do you think, Hanson? <laughs> Alright. Time to wrap the building. I'm using a 9 foot roll of Tyvek housing wrap. To fasten the Tyvek down, I'm using 12 gauge 1 inch galvanized cap nails. To make wrapping the upper portion easier, I have a little trick. Cut your housing wrap on your chop saw. To tape the seam, I use Tyvek 2 inch tape. Time for some paint. We got some new toys here. We've got the True Coat 360. Uh, this was recommended by. Jason Cole from Jason Explains Things. Uh, see how it works. For the fascia boards, I use four 20 foot, 1 by 10 tight knot cedar. I've always found it easier to paint on the ground than touch up once in place. Some people like to paint in place. Do whatever feels right to you. As far as the sprayer goes, this little guy is pretty sweet, though the hopper runs out of paint pretty quickly. To hang the fascia, I made a couple of support brackets that dropped down an inch and a half below the 2x8. This helped hold the boards nice and flush as I screwed them in. I made sure to hang the front and back first, so that when it came to the sides, I was able to set the board in place and then trace the angles at the ends. This allowed for me to make the perfect cut on site. For the soffit, I used 24 12 foot 1x6 tongue and groove cedar boards. To hang the cedar, I used my Porta Cable 18 gauge narrow crown stapler and 1 and a half inch staples. To tap the wood into place, I'm using a rubber dead blow mallet and a small scrap of tongue and groove that I use as a strike plate so that I don't damage the seams when I tap the boards into place. In the front, where the two boards join together in the middle, Instead of having a straight line, I alternate the cuts by 16 inches so that the boards overlap each other and create a zipper effect. At a later date, I intend on installing soffit vents to ensure proper ventilation. Before laying down your roof underlayment, it's a good idea to attach the drip rail. For good measure, I've added a little sealant caulk at the seams. For my roofing underlayment, I use two rolls of StormGuard polypropylene self-adhesive underlayment. This stuff is the business. Not only does it go down like a giant sticker, it self seals around nails and roofing fasteners, making sure everything is extra watertight. As you can see, I was a hair shy on complete coverage. For the final three square feet, I used rubberized window flashing. For my roofing, I went with Skyline Standing Seam Metal Roofing Panels. Setting your first panel is most important. You want to measure and measure again to make sure that you're nice and square. Your panel should hang approximately one inch over the bottom edge and be one to two inches from the top edge. To connect the panels together, line them up at the bottom and then snap the standing seam together working your way from the bottom to the top. Being that I set my rafters at 16 inches on center and the roof panels are 16 inches wide, every fastener hits a stud. For the gable caps, I needed to stitch together two panels and cut one to length. For this, I used a pair of tin snips to make my cuts. I put the butyl tape on each panel individually and stitch them together in place. When it came to the other side, I found it easier to stitch the panels together and lay down one continuous run of butyl tape before setting the panels in place and screwing them down. Before installing the peak cap, you need to put down your self-adhesive foam enclosure inserts along with a line of butyl tape on top of the foam. Stitch your cap together, then screw it into place running your fasteners through the foam and butyl tape. Time to install the windows. 
For the bottom of the window frame, I use self adhesive rubberized window flashing. Before setting the window in place, run a nice thick bead of door and window sealant along the top and the side window flanges, but never on the bottom. Once your window is screwed into place, run your window flashing over the side flanges first, then the top. Once you've done this, pull down the housing wrap and tape it over the top flashing. You never want to flash or seal the bottom window flange. Installing the door. At the base of the threshold, I'm installing a jam seal seal pan. I laid down some blue flashing as well as three thick beads of window and door sealant before installing the seal pan. The door I'm using is a ThermaTrue fiberglass door. It comes pre-hung with brick mold and is primed and ready for paint. On the back side of the brick mold, I put down a thick bead of window and door sealant. With a level and some shims, I made sure the door was nice and plumb before screwing it in. I decided this would be the perfect time to paint the door as I don't want to get any black paint on the shingles that I will be installing later. Like the fascia boards earlier, I decided to paint the siding before installation. For the main siding, I'm using 13 sheets of 5 8 inch T111. With the paint sprayer, I was getting a little more than a sheet and a half per hopper of paint. Everything was going great until the fuzzy foreman decided to inspect my work and leave little paw prints everywhere. Hanging T111 is super easy as the seams line up with your studs at 16 inches on center. And there is a little tab on both ends that helps keep everything looking consistent. Time to install the cedar shingles. I use six bundles or one and a half square of shingles. The one thing that will make your installation look pro more than anything else is how much attention you pay when stitching the corners together. While installing, I use a piece of scrap lumber as a guide to make sure that my line and reveal remains consistent. When I hang shingles, I get very zen, even meditative. It's probably my favorite part of the build. Sometimes in the middle of your build, you might change your mind. This is why I like to use screws. I was originally only going to run shingles on the right hand side of the door, instead I'll have an even amount on both sides of the door. To hang the shingles, I'm using my Porta Cable stapler and one and a quarter inch small crown staples. The front is easy compared to the sides. There's no angle cuts at the top or corners to stitch together. Just find the right piece and staple it down. At this point, the main structure is done. It just needs some touch-up paint and some stain. Time to build the deck. For the deck, I use five pier blocks with four x four hangers, 26 joist hangers, and 70 headlock lag screws. The pressure treated lumber consisted of one eight foot four x six, 14 12 foot two x tens, eight 12 foot two x sixes, 23 eight foot two x sixes, and one eight foot two x eight.
A little secret when placing your deck boards is your carpenter pencil will create the perfect gap. The rain set in when I installed the stairs to the deck. Unfortunately, I did not capture the process on video. I also didn't capture the privacy wall I built on the back of the deck. From start to finish, the build took approximately 18 working days over the course of several months during the summer of 2020. This is hands down the largest project I have ever attempted to do by myself. I found the process very rewarding, and I'm happy with how it turned out. I hope you enjoyed watching, and here's the final product, along with Carrie's Garden in Full Bloom.